Hello everyone and welcome to my studio at UNC Pembroke. Today we're continuing our conversation that I began with my most recent video about what I consider to be the four basic areas of brass playing. Tone, rhythm, clarity, and flow. And today is rhythm. What we're going to do is we're going to look at it independently. Often when we look at rhythm, we're looking at it when we're already in the middle of something difficult, we're working on a solo, and we're looking at many of the areas of brass playing, rhythm just being one. Today, I wanted to break it down into its parts and see if we could figure out how to approach it independent of some of the other things like articulation. We're also going to bring in members of a team, some quotes and ideas from other people in the field who have thought about this and have walked this path before us, our educators. And the idea of rhythm has a lot of bias to it. One of those main biases is that you either have it or you don't, and that's false. We're gonna blow that one out of the water today. Rhythm is earned. And today we're gonna to talk about how we earn it, how we do that. We're going to begin with the very first of the four ideas I want to share with you today, which comes to us from Susan Slaughter. Susan Slaughter is a trumpeter. She was in the St. Louis Symphony for her career, and many of you might know that she also founded a very important nonprofit organization, the International Women's Brass Conference. This was almost 30 years ago now, and it is an organization that was designed in the pre-internet days to network and to help people, especially women, but it is open to all gender identities. The IWBC was formed to give people a place to network and to showcase the work of women, which at the time wasn't happening at the brass conferences and events. Susan Slaughter founds the IWBC. She plays in the St. Louis Symphony her, for her whole career, and she's a wonderful role model for us. And she has a saying, don't go it alone. And I love that, don't go it alone. What she means by this is use your team, gather, use your people. This, she meant about the music business, about having a career as a brass player specifically, and we're gonna use it today in regard to rhythm. Don't go it alone. So the first aspect of rhythm area for today is use a team. We have a team approach. The team is both electronic and physical. Obviously, we know we're going to use things like the metronome. This is, the metronome has come a long way since the TikTok ones that some of you still might have on your shelves. I know I have one right over there. And the metronome now has all kinds of great technological advances, such as the ability to subdivide, do individual numbers. And there are metronome types that you can clip to you, which give you a vibration on the beat. We were using that a lot in the marching arts now. These small vibrations allow us to feel the beat, and that might be very helpful. The electronic advances in metronomes are great. You have one on your phone, you can Google it. We definitely want to make sure we use them in all of the subdivisions and everything. The metronome and electronic aids for rhythm. One of the things that is true of rhythm is we're usually not aware when it's going wrong. And if we're gonna fix our rhythm, we first have to know what's wrong with it. What are we doing wrong? This is why we need to have a team. You need to have teachers, you need to have helpers. The metronome can do that for us when we're by ourselves. It shows us what's going wrong. And that leads me into the next thing, recording. We need to make sure we're recording. It's a, a tough thing. When you record, you feel like you might wanna put the horn down and never pick it back up again. But promise yourself that when you record, you're gonna take everything from it. And you're gonna see that as just a part of your journey. Like when you bought a Blazovich book and you bought an Arben book and you got your metronome and your pencil out and you put them on the music stand. It's the same with recording. It shouldn't only be done when we're getting ready for a competition. It should be done all the time so you don't let it get to you as much. Recording is one of the main ways that we can see if we're out from rhythm because remember, we're not necessarily aware. Another bias we have is that you would only use tools like recording or metronomes if you're really, really messing up or if you're a beginner. That's not true, we wanna use them all the time. Once in a while, turn it off and see how it's going, but you wanna have these things as a regular part of your routine. Another one is grooves. Use grooves, play your major scales and put on a groove. There are a lot of great grooves tracks out there that you can find online to play along with or get creative and make your own so that you can play along with it in your major scale routine, for example. Make yourself a track in garage band or something like that, play along with it. The other team members we have, Arbin, Blazovich, Terrell, Koprash. We have all of our etude books, and this is definitely important. 
I am a big fan of all of those. And again, bias. We don't play lyrical things with a metronome. That's not true. Play your lyrical things with a metronome, such as your Roshu book. If we have a Roshu book, for example, that features some phrase of the like, dotted 16th, 30 seconds, we can set that met to subdivide something like the first and last of the four sixteenths, for example. And we can play the Roshu with that subdivision click going. Again, you want to be musical, but I say you need to play it straight first. The other members of our team come at us from our partners. The people in our sections, our teachers, we can play duos. If you don't have that right now, you can do multi-tracks with yourself. That shows you where your rhythm is, for sure. Even if you have a click in your ear, it's funny how it can go off. Using your team and your partners, the people in your life who play with you, to show what's going on with your rhythm. We don't always know. So the first area, Susan Slaughter reminds us, don't go it alone. Use your team, use your toolbox, use everything you have to think about learning about yourself and what you tend to do wrong for rhythm. And don't get caught in biases that not everybody needs it. We all need it. Rhythm is earned. The next area I want to remind us of comes from the famous jazz singer, Sarah Vaughan. She said, there are notes between the notes. This idea has come to us in many forms across the years from many different people. I love her saying it as notes between the notes. We sometimes hear it from, it's been attributed to people like Mozart and Debussy, that the most important parts of being musical are the spaces between the notes. That's another common quote we hear. Sarah saying, notes between notes, and I like that as an instrumentalist because it reminds me I'm not only responsible for what I'm playing, I'm responsible for when I'm playing it. And this subdivision aspect is a familiar one. We all tell each other, subdivide it. But what does that mean? Firstly, let's recognize that there's two separate areas regarding rhythm. The first is pulse. I am responsible for playing the same steady beat across the piece or across the, whatever I'm doing in my ensemble. The pulse across the work cannot slow down or speed up unless that was the intent of the composer. This is another bias. There is a sense that as a human, because I have a heartbeat, I should be able to do that. That's false. That's very hard to do, actually. Maintaining a steady pulse across the work. That is where we can use our metronome to catch why aren't we? What, what is keeping us from this? We're slowing down, speeding up. The pulse is that first thing over time, over the whole etude. The second part of that, though, is yes, you may be hitting the pulse okay. You're clicking your quarter note. You're in your Roshu book. Okay, I got it. But what's happening inside the beat might not be equal, and that's where we get the subdivision. You're looking at the long pulse, but then you're also looking at the subdivision. So when Sarah says to us, note between note, that's what she means. There's a lot of tools, as we mentioned, the sense that you can set the metronomes for different subdivisions. Another thing you can do with the metronome is there's a frequency idea to this now. The metronome apps will allow you to turn off some of it. There's apps that will let you turn off Maybe you won't only want to have 80% of the clicks happening, and then they come in and surprise you. You can see if you were keeping going, and especially if you set it to a subdivision like 4 sixteenths. So what you want to do is you want to look for exercises and etudes which will do this for you. Something like a Roshu with 30 seconds, that's what those etude books are for. That's why they're there. Make sure we're using that member of our team. There's a wonderful set of chromatic scales in Arvin. It goes eighths, and then it goes triplets, and then sixteenths. So what he's giving us is a two division, a three division, and a four division. And if you do those beautiful Arvin chromatics in your fundamental routine every day, you get used to those divisions. Then when you're sent something like a five tuplet or seven on a beat, you're aware of how to divide that. The notes between the notes, Sarah tells us. Another aspect that we need to make sure we remember to use in our team is our etude books, Blazovich, Terrell, Koprash, Deanna Swoboda. She has a beautiful Lipsler book out now. You should go grab it. I showed it to you in my tone video. These kind of etude books really ask us to change up patterns. One of my favorites that I thought is a good example for this discussion is Koprash number eight. Koprash number eight is 16th notes, but where he varies, the slur and tongue pattern changes. So we might be used to that 16th division, but then we see it's tongue slur, slur, slur. And then he switches it to slur, 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 tongue, and then back, asking us to change it up. 
I love that one. This sense of I'm in a pattern, I'm comfortable, and then up oh, broke the pattern, have to get out of it, reset the pattern. That helps us understand where we go wrong rhythmically. We need to know what is it that is preventing us from this concept of being able to keep steady time, and especially as tuba players and as euphonium players, we need to be able to keep steady beat for our ensembles. The next area I want to address comes from my teacher from New England Conservatory where I did my master's, Chester Schmitz. Chester started out in the Army Band and then went to the Boston Symphony Orchestra where he played for his whole career. And Chester had a saying, you must overcome the partials. I love that. You must overcome the partials. And what he means by that is, let's not let the horn stand in the way of our music making. Let's not let any, any mechanical difficulties get in our way of being artists and of communicating our message on stage. Let's make sure that that is fluid at all times. Overcoming the partials is a reminder that we need to get in the chair and become better players. We need to fix what we're doing wrong on the tuba and euphonium so that we can shine. And rhythm is definitely one of these things. Don't get caught up in a bias that because you're emoting and you're making music that you don't need to keep steady time. Steady time is what makes the music sing. We need to be able to change it, and you're allowed to mess with it once you have it. So, overcome the partials is definitely great advice from Chester for this, and a reminder that we need to make sure we're okay in regard to the instrument, that it's not standing in our way. Bessie Smith, the great blues singer, she had a saying also, I set the rhythm. This was in a quote that regarding that she didn't need a drummer, I set the rhythm. And that's definitely true. And you can't set the rhythm if you're still struggling with the horn. Now, I'm never gonna get rid of struggling with the horn, but it does go down a bit the more fundamental routines you do. In my tone video, I go over what I think should be there in our practice routine, what I do every day. Doing these things is going to make it a lot easier for you to execute the rhythms in your work. All right, we've talked about how Susan Slaughter told us, don't go it alone, we need to use our team. Then Sarah Vaughn reminded us that there's notes between the notes and told us that we have to subdivide and we can't think we're too good for that. Then Chester Schmitz reminded us that we need to overcome the partials. We need to become better players so that we can do this more easily. It does get easier, I promise. Lastly, we go to Harvey Phillips and Arnold Jacobs too. Harvey Phillips, one of our wonderful educators and performers in the history of tuba and euphonium, he had a wonderful saying, 90% of our mistakes are made around the area of a breath. And so breathing is my final area of rhythm for us today. I think that's so wise. 90% of our mistakes are made in the area of a breath. And he meant either coming up to a breath or after taking a breath, the stumble that happens. Here we're talking about rhythm today. And I think that one of the main things that stands in the way of our having and achieving better flow and forward motion and rhythm is that we don't plan the breathing enough. We need to think about taking air before it's too late. One symptom of this is playing for too long and then having to tank up and not being able to get back in in time. Also, use etudes that challenge you in this way. I found a great example in the Sloshberg book, which is one of my favorite ones, where what we have is steady 16ths through the whole exercise. So breathing is a tricky thing there, right? We need to make sure that we're playing four 16ths in every bar. I decided that I was going to catch a breath at the end of every bar. It's more comfortable to go two bars and then breathe, but you only have in this exercise, you have four sixteenths, so you have to catch the breath at the end of the four sixteenths before the downbeat. That's not enough time to really get a strong breath in if you've played for two bars and been empty. The secret to that exercise would be breathing in every bar, just sips of air. Straight sixteenths, same articulation, scales, and when you do that, when you're really faced with this idea that I need to catch those quick sips of air, Again, Harvey Phillips reminding us we're making mistakes around our breathing spots. So the sense of addressing that, looking for it and expecting it, knowing that the breathing will likely be a cause, like lack of technique, that was Chester's quote, the breathing reminder from Harvey and the lack of technique reminder from Chester saying, look, you gotta get in the chair and do the work. This good rhythm will come, but remember it's earned. One aspect of this is we need to make sure we take a clearing breath a nice, open, easy, relaxed intake at the beginning. And we can't go crazy with one of these, <gasps> play. We need to take that full, really nice, filling up, getting power, getting ready to go. Remember Bessie Smith, I don't need a drummer. I set the time. 
you need to make sure that you allow that prep. So a clearing breath, a prep, really good, solid opening breath before you start. And then taking breaths more often than you might feel comfortable with. Arm and arpeggios are another one where this really comes in, especially on tuba, down and active, having enough air. Use that reminder from Harvey Phillips. If we take a breath and when we upset the embouchure and then we try to come in, we often miss that note. You're, you're making sure that you're breathing in the way that interrupts the flow the least. We're using our team. We're going to make sure there's notes between the notes and that we don't do anything strange to our pulse or our subdivision. We're going to do fundamentals so that we can recognize that that's what's often standing in the way of our rhythm. And we're going to look at rhythm independently of other things. We're going to get off the bias of I emote as a musician and therefore I'm not required to keep steady time. That's wrong. Sam Palafian, if he was here, he would tell you that was wrong. You can make amazing music while keeping steady time and everyone will want to play with you. You keep the best time in the neighborhood. Lastly, a reminder from Arnold Jacobs, Harvey Phillips, all of our gurus about the importance of breath, the placement of breath, the physical where you take your breaths. Chester also had a saying about breathing that goes along with what Harvey Phillips means. Chester used to say, the audience will breathe with you if you show them where it goes. The audience will breathe with you if you show them where it goes. I think that's such a magic quote because it gives us permission. Chester, thank you, you're giving us permission. Take those breaths, it's a tuba, especially for tuba and euphonium players, of course, also. It's a tuba for heaven's sakes. They can see that this is, this is this massive endeavor we've taken on. Take the breath, but don't apologize for it. Don't make it seem uncomfortable for the audience. Show them where it goes. Harvey Phillips would want you to then come back, make sure that you're not making a mistake in that area. This aspect of rhythm comes down mostly to this sense of bias that we somehow are already fine. If we're a success, maybe you're a college player, you're doing well, that there, there is a sense that your rhythm is all right, it's fixed. It's not, we address it every single day. Record yourself, use those grooves, use all of your team members to check and recheck so that you can earn that rhythm. And we're all in this struggle together, believe me. Thanks for coming to studio today. I hope you stay well and keep earning that rhythm.